intro, thank you very much. You know, I, uh, my name is Prem Chandrasekharan. I work for this uh, consultancy called ThoughtWorks. Uh, I've been in industry for the good part of the last uh, 25 years, as she said. Um, and I'm very glad to be here, you know, so, uh, yeah, so that's me, uh, you know, and um, when I was actually writing the, the abstract for this, it didn't quite sound as, as cheesy as it did. I mean, I, I hear it now and I'm like, did I actually say that? Um, but, uh, but, you know, you're at a conference, you know, so everything goes. Um, but uh, here is the thing, right? I mean, I'll try and, and give you some of my experiences. And some of them might work for you, some of them might not, but that's okay. Uh, you know, so uh, here is another thing about me. Uh, I actually also had the pleasure of writing a, a blue book, you know, blue book on domain-driven design, actually, you know, so uh, I actually think that uh, that's probably the more practical version of it. You know, Eric Evans wrote the original. Uh, you know, I like to think that uh, I'm very modest, as you can, as you can, uh, uh, you know, figure out here, you know, but, but look, you know, so all jokes apart, I am pretty passionate uh, technologist and uh, very glad to be here. So let's get started. And I've got um, a bit of a, a deployment horror story here. You know, so this is uh, Night Capital. Anybody heard of Night Capital? Yep, I mean, they, they, were, pretty, uh, they were pretty much uh, in the news uh, about a decade or so ago. And here is what happened with them, right? They accidentally deployed an older version of their software. And they're a, uh, you know, they're a stock trading uh, kind of firm, right? And that's what they do. So they uh, you know, trade in a lot of money. And in 45 minutes, because of that error, they lost $440 million. Now, uh, that was actually more than the revenue that they made annually, right? And they, they kind of tried and, and uh, borrowed some money and did all of that, but in the next six months, they got acquired by a rival firm. Right, now if you're thinking I like name dropping, then here is uh, another, or a few, right? You know, so my idea is not to name drop, and these are all wonderful companies. They have been at the forefront of what they do. But at this point in time, some of them don't even exist. For example, Toys R Us is gone, right? And why are they gone? Because they probably were not able to optimize what they did and be more productive, right? You know, so here is what we are all doing at the end of the day, right? I'm going to be Captain Obvious, and I'm going to tell you what you already know, right? So, uh, so here is what we have. We have a delivery pipeline. Or before that, we have a bunch of ideas which we think are really, really good, great even. And then we take them through the wash cycle of the delivery pipeline. And then we put it in the hands of our customers who then use it, provide us feedback, and then this cycle continues. Right? But what is it that those companies that I just flashed weren't able to do? Right? They were not able to do three things. They were not able to do uh, things rapidly, reliably, and they were not able to make it repeatable, maybe, right? Now, here is the thing, right? You probably may have two of these three, you may have one of these three, but it's not good enough, right? Because you have to have all three R's. If you don't have all three R's, then, uh, then you know, you can't sustain. You can't sustain for a long time. So here are some companies that are actually able to do it, right? Now, as I say it, maybe some of them may not be the, the, the shining light as they are today, right? And like I said, I don't like name dropping, but I still do it anyway, right? So here is Amazon and Netflix. I know that you're not Amazon, you're not Netflix, and if you are, good on you, right? And if you work for any of these companies or the ones that I just showed, again, not sitting in judgment, just trying to learn, right? Okay, so what am I here to talk about, right? So you know all of this, so the question really is, what is it that these companies that are successful or are wildly successful doing differently? So let's see what they do, right? So here is, here is a thing that I'm going to talk about. The engineering value stream. What do you mean by the engineering value stream? So here is something that I mean by what the engineering value stream is. So you, what do you do? 
just like I showed in the previous picture, you plan for something, you code it, you validate it, deploy it, and release it, and then you get feedback by monitoring it, and then the cycle continues. But then this looks great at a, at a high level. What is it that you can actually do to m get better, right? So here is something that I'm going to show you, right? Okay, so a lot of folks talk, talked about DevSecOps. A lot of folks talked about, Michelle talked about culture, right? Um, and here is something that uh, we at ThoughtWorks pride ourselves on being able to do, right? The, the operative word here is discipline. So I can't come and tell you that, okay, here is something that you can do and tomorrow you're going to transform, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. There are no fat diets, there are no uh, uh, easy shortcuts, but here are a bunch of things that have worked for us. Now, is it this exact same thing that we do on every single team that we work with? Absolutely not. Is, are all of these equally important? Absolutely not. Is your list going to be different than mine? Absolutely, right? But the point is that you need to focus on a bunch of things intentionally so that you can be rapid, reliable, and repeatable. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're basically looking at this and taking pictures, go ahead, do that, right? But, but the point is not to show you a whole ton of things here. But we do quite a lot of these things, and we are really good at it. And some of us here who are critics might say, you know what, I mean, some of these are very, very obvious. I mean, what is this, right? You're talking about test-driven development. You're talking about unit testing. We have been doing that for years, right? But then the point is that you need to reflect on whether, you know, some, doing some of these practices is actually leading the outcomes that you want, right? If you're not getting those outcomes, maybe there is something that you need to reconsider even though you might be going through a lot of these practices and, and, uh, and you're not seeing the, the value, then what really are we, are we, are we achieving? Anyway, okay, so, so there is that, right? So the question is, yes, we are going through this, but how do we know that we are actually being effective, right? Here are a few things that you can do. So four things that I can think of, right? If you can make some of these I say reusable and I said re in, in brackets because the first thing you want to do is you want to make something that you're providing usable. So if you're providing capabilities, then you want to make them usable first and then look to make them reusable. You also want them discoverable because if nobody knows you've, you've got something, obviously that, that doesn't work. Uh, they need to know that it exists before they can start reusing it. It obviously needs to be secure because we are at a DevSecOps conference. And finally, um, it has to be self-service, right? If I can serve myself, the best, that's probably the, the best way of, of getting things to, uh, to work. In other words, what I'm telling you is that you probably want to embrace a platform mindset. Now, what I mean by that is, oh, well, I mean, we are not building, everybody is not a platform company, everybody is not uh, building AWS. Absolutely, you may not, right? But then adopting that same mindset even for internal things that you do. So it might be as simple as, okay, here are a bunch of refactorings that work in our context, right? Um, it might be something that you want to look to, to make reusable, right? So it's about, about uh, the spirit of, of uh, adopting that platform mindset, not necessarily that you build public-facing platforms. The other thing that you need to do probably, because it's 2024, and if I don't talk about generative AI, maybe you know, I, I'm not a popular person anymore. But I will say this, right? I mean, so we have been doing generative AI or, or being trying to, we have been trying to adopt generative AI in pockets in a, a variety of things that we do, right? Starting with coding, but it's not just only about coding, it's not just about GitHub Copilot. Right? There are several other things, testing, data preparation, uh, analysis, uh, summarization, a whole bunch of these things. You can adopt generative AI, and I say this with, with, uh, with utmost seriousness when I said garnish of generative AI. Okay? You can't expect generative AI to suddenly start uh, taking over the world and you start firing half of your, uh, uh, half of your or you're not needing half of your uh, delivery workforce. That's unlikely to happen, but I mean, stranger things have happened. Uh, but we do think that generative AI can help. And, and uh, 
If you're looking for recipes, then uh, absolutely, uh, it's either a, a separate talk by itself or I'm still available today and tomorrow if you want to uh, exchange notes. So maybe you're like, you know, okay, this is all great. I mean, at a conference, you can come in and say generative AI and all of that, but we work in a very, very secure and uh, uh, you know, a restricted environment. So one thing that you can do is that you can start safely with local AI. You don't have to go out to open AI. You don't have to go out to Anthropic. You don't have to go out to Google, right? You can do this with a bunch of, a bunch of things. Olama is one, right? It is a, think of it as a, as, a, as a generative AI LLM server, right? It works in conjunction with a bunch of, of open source models if you want and closed source models if you, if you can but it works with them with equal ease. And then, you know, now you're like, okay, I've got, an, I've got uh, an LLM at my disposal. It is safe. It's not reaching out to the internet. I need a bunch of really, really good prompts, right? So Fabric is that, right? So it's something that, that you can use from the CLI. It's available open source on GitHub. It comes with a bunch of, of really, really awesome prompts. And now you can start using them for a variety of use cases. And then if you're, if, you're, if you're actually coding, then continue is something that you can use in a lieu of or in addition to GitHub Copilot. All open source, so it uses Olama and open source uh, LLMs to allow you to do this. And you gain the productivity gain without having to send your code or your private data out over to the internet. And finally, if you're someone who likes UIs, then, uh, then there is open web UI, which basically is a front end on top of Ulama. And now you can use it just like you do uh, with ChatGPT, except that it's not ChatGPT. Now the good thing is, um, if you've got reasonably new machines, then you can actually do it on your own machine itself without bringing it to a complete grinding halt, right? I do that on this MacBook Pro that I have, and I'm able to do this pretty reasonably, right? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to use some of, the, some of the larger models, or you cannot, but if you are in a place where you absolutely cannot, then this is an option, right? Uh, and it's a pretty decent option if you ask me. And I can tell you from experience that I've gained over the last 12 or so months. And uh, like everything else in life, uh, all of it is open source, available on GitHub, so, so you can go take a look at it yourself. But then here is the thing, right? I showed you a bunch of these things, and there's so much to do here. I'm like, OK, uh, so are we saying that we have to get really good at every single one of these? We are only a 50-person organization. Really? I mean, do you want us to do all of these? Probably not, right? So what do we do as engineers? We prioritize. But then the question is, how do you prioritize? Because I've got so many things to choose from. So here are a few things. Again, you've got this thing, plan code, blah, 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 all of that, right? And then now you do this thing where, OK, I've got this axis, high value, low, medium, high value, low, medium, high pain. We are not doing something like this. How much value is it? OK, this is high value. How much pain is it causing? It is causing high pain, OK? So then you start plotting some of these things to see, OK, which one of these or which amongst these are going to help us get there? Right? So now you, you plot some of these, and then you, you come up with a, with a graph like this. But then you don't have to stop there. I mean, there is value and pain. There is current, current adoption and value. Okay. So now if you see here, it's, it's high, medium, low. So I've got low adoption for this right? and, and high value. So, so you, you basically, again, get a bunch of uh, information in terms of what is valuable to you. And then here is another thing. Is it feasible in our, our ecosystem? OK, everybody says test-driven development is great. But then we have a code base that is legacy for the last 20 years. Nobody has done TDD. It's so hard to do TDD. It's great, but it's not feasible in our ecosystem, at least not in the near term. So what do you do, right? So, so pain, adoption, feasibility against value. Now, these are not the only things that you have to do this. I mean, you can do this for several other things, but at least you get some objective measure of, what, uh, of how to proceed, right? Now you've got several things that you can do. You, you've got some heuristic to decide. And then, yeah, I mean, if you see a lot of these things, common things appear on the top right corner of these, then you know that, okay, that's probably the one that I want to, uh, want to really go after. 
And, and this is a systematic disciplined way. Okay, so now let's say you've picked a bunch of these things or, or a small sliver of, of things to, to work on, and now you're on this, on this continuous improvement uh, loop. So here is the thing, right? Everybody who is an engineering manager here or is in some kind of leadership position here, they're like, okay, how do we really know? We have done, we have, okay, great, we have got this uh, list of things to do. We have prioritized and we have picked up something and we have already started doing some of these things. We don't know how, how we are really getting better. So here is the thing, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, we all know that. But then here is our own chief scientist. This is Martin Fowler. Uh, and he says that false measures can only make things worse. So, and he also goes on to say that you cannot measure productivity. In fact, if you go on his Blicky or his blog, he actually has a whole article, article on this, right? And, and look, I've been at ThoughtWorks for the last 20 or so odd years, so it's not as if I'm saying that he's wrong, right? Not at all. But then, what is the definitive measure of of quality, WTFs per minute. Now, uh, if you're thinking what WTF is, it's where the, where's the food? I know that I'm the only one standing between you and lunch, so I do understand that, uh, that you know, lunch is very important, so don't let your brain get uh, fancy ideas, right? It's not what you're thinking. But then, but then, yeah, I mean, look, you know, so on the one hand, we really want to, uh, to measure, and on the other hand, we know that it's really, really hard, right? So what do we do, right? So here are a bunch of things that you already have, and, and again, Dora was mentioned. There is space as well, which, again, Dr. Nicole Forsgren has been involved in and has championed for the last uh, few years. There is flow, there is... ThoughtWorks ourselves, we have come up with something called EBO, which is engineering effectiveness uh, correlated to business objectives. And then the rally folks, the folks who make that project management tool have got something called SGPI. And then, uh, and then Nicole and a few others like Abhi Noda and so on and so forth, uh, and, and a few others have also come up with this thing called DevEx, uh, DevEx right? In fact, Abhi Noda, he's the CEO of, uh, of this company DX. Uh, they actually make this this product, right? And uh, you know, in fact, I had the opportunity to talk to him on the ThoughtWorks Technology podcast. Really, really good thoughts, right? And there is no dearth of of things that you can uh, that you can do, right? And then here are a bunch of things that these these things are actually looking to measure: a bunch of qualitative and quantitative uh, measures. So, what is qualitative? Something that is a perception, something that is. Uh, 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 that is, you know, you, you, you basically get it through humans. I mean, you're like, okay, how happy do you feel? I mean, it's not something that you can quantify. You cannot, it's a, you cannot associate a number with it. Whereas with quantitative things like, okay, I have this amount of code coverage, or I deploy uh, 15 times a day, right? So that's quantitative. So, and, and a lot of these, these tools will allow you to measure quantitative, qualitative, lagging, leading metrics, a whole bunch of them. And then also what you have to realize is this, right? You've got, um, you've got a bunch of stakeholders, and they vary across the organization. <laughs> right from your individual developer to somebody who's a senior stakeholder who's actually making the investment, and everybody else in between, right? And it is important for, for us to, to appreciate that their needs are very different. Uh, a developer or a team leader or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know um, a, a team themselves, right? I mean, they might be looking for something else than a senior exec who's actually making a bunch of mon uh, monetary investments. So now if you try to show, you know, I've, uh, a senior leader that I've got 120% code coverage, I know you can only have 100, but in some cases I've seen that people are so enthusiastic that they say that, you know, they've got that. Right? Or my velocity is, is so high, right? Uh, you know, they probably don't care about that. They are probably thinking, okay, you know what, okay, am I really going to get this done or not, right? And they're, they're probably thinking binary that way. And you're like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. So what we have to appreciate is that the ecosystem of gathering and measuring is really, really hard in the context of software teams. So what can you do, right? Which is, uh, which is something that is practical where we don't say that it's only WTF per minute 
and then and then we don't uh, you know start, you know put a bunch of metrics in you where you've got a, a very very complex looking dashboard and it's like okay i've got 15 widgets on the screen looks like this team is doing really well right you know you need a balance right so what do you do right so here are some heuristics for you now i know there are lots of things that 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 are here on this on the screen right but two things that i'll i'll really tell you that you need to focus on one carrot and stick seldom works right it only only motivates people to game the system this has happened to us over and over and over again right and michel talked about culture right this is where culture comes in what kind of culture are you looking to perpetrate as a leader right if you say that you're going to go with a stick against people and and and, and now what people will do is they will go optimize for the metrics that you are measuring them against so if it is team velocity they will show you that they have the highest team velocity possible if you say it's code coverage then they will tell you that they have got 120% coverage when you can only have 100 right so that definitely does not work the other thing that does work you know is is this right so how many how many folks here know this uh, this uh, this tool which is called a ratchet anybody yeah okay so for those who don't right a ratchet is a thing that only turns in one direction so once you turn it it cannot turn back okay so so what what you might want to look to do is to is to use your metrics like a ratchet so let's say your code coverage is 30% right now you want to probably set a target of 35% why because that's more sustainable than saying okay i'm going to go from 30 to 90% in one week probably not sustainable no fat diets here right not possible spot uh, weight reduction does not work in uh, in in real life it does not work in the case of software so so what you do is now you say okay i have made some real effort effective ways in which i can go from 30 to 35 and now i say my new baseline is now 35 so if my baseline goes below 35 i will stop the line i will actually make uh, i will not deploy this to production because there is a quality issue here and then now you say okay okay 35 30 has become 35 40 so now you can sustain right now you're actually likely going to reap the benefits of this other as as opposed to developers just going through the motions of writing tests which have no assertions in them which just boost code coverage right how many of us have have seen that happen right you tell them we want 90% coverage and they're like yeah tomorrow we have gone from 20 to 90 it has happened to a lot of us we chuckle right but this is reality why because this is how humans are right so and there are a bunch of tools you don't have to you don't have to worry about that i mean you don't have to do this manually i mean there are open source and closed source uh, some that are that are better than others and so on and so forth uh, but but really that's that's really the crux of it so again before you take a picture of this right i want to give you a big disclaimer this is not my favorite right all i'm trying to say here is that you need to be looking at a variety of dimensions you cannot just look at one thing and conclude i mean I, there was uh, there was a, during the keynote there was a six blind men metaphor right uh, and the elephant yeah you only look at one of these you are probably being that uh, blind person so don't be that blind person right so you do want to look at a uh, 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 a variety of things but then there is a a place of of uh, diminishing marginal utility so just because i'm saying okay look at more than one thing don't look at 300 things right now you're like okay that's only going to confuse so but but i do think that you probably do need to look at more than one right so in this case i'm looking at project tracking source control quality ci cd and production this is illustrative in my mind right this is not exact this is not what i'm telling you to do but then you will see this here it's it's business effectiveness you also want to keep something there right you want to uh, you want to have a mix of technology and business because at the end of the day most of us work for a work for a company and a draw a salary which means that you know we are here to make some money right so unless it is effective you've got all of these metrics you've got the dora metrics will not matter right because if it is not something that is effective from a business perspective doesn't matter what else you're doing
right? But, but then you can't only say that this is the business effectiveness is the only thing I measure. Because you also want to know where things are going wrong, right? Because that's where, I mean, if, if there is a, 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 a criticism of the DORA metrics, I don't know, this is probably blasphemous, but I'm going to say it, is that the DORA metrics are lagging metrics. They tell you that there is something wrong, right? But they don't tell you why something is, is going wrong. So you also want to put a bunch of metrics that tell you why, right? So that you, you, you just adopted TDD, but nothing's happening. None of these metrics are moving, so you probably need to know why, right? So you need to need those forensics, and that's why you probably need a little bit more than just the DORA metrics. Not to say that they're bad, right? They're very, very good. But you need some more. Okay. Um, so, so what, what is it that I'm saying? So if you remember one thing, one slide, this is what I'm saying, right? So you establish a set of sensible defaults. You prioritize which ones of them are important. You set up a, a, a bunch of metrics and ratchet on them. And then you keep doing this. And that probably is your surefire way to get healthy, to get uh, more productive. Well, that's all I had. Thank you. I appreciate you being very patient. See you around.